If you were kidnapped by a serial killer and forced to play a brutal death game, what would you do? These are the most unfair traps in the whole Saw franchise, especially the last trap which is the hardest of them all, and you'll never guess how we're going to beat it. So I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat every death trap in Spiral. This man is about to be brutally murdered by a death trap and it's like nothing you've ever seen. It's July 4th, and this off-duty cop is walking around a carnival when he sees a thief run away with a woman's purse. The detective chases after him through the crowded streets, but he can't keep up and loses the man's trail. That's when he finds an open manhole and realizes the thief has gone into the sewers. With no choice, he follows the purse snatcher down into the hole and has no idea he's walking right into a trap. Hearing a noise in the distance, the cop searches around in the darkness and spots the thief sitting on a chair, but the man isn't moving. Getting closer, the detective kicks him to the ground but discovers that it's just a mannequin. Suddenly, a man in a pig mask appears and grabs him from behind, knocking him out cold. Hours later, the cop slowly wakes up to find his hands have been restrained with barbed wire and his tongue is locked in a vice. Looking around, he realizes he's standing on top of a stepladder in the middle of a subway rail line, and in front of him is a television set. Suddenly, the TV turns on and his kidnapper in the pig mask tells the detective that he must now play a death game. He's being punished for lying on the witness stand and sending innocent people to jail. Now, he must rip his own tongue out if he wants to live, but has only two minutes to act before the train will run him down. With that, the television set turns off, leaving the man alone to face his punishment. The detective pulls the barbed wire off his wrist and tries to pry the vice open, but it's useless. He can't force it apart, and on the other end of the tunnel, the lights of the train are getting closer. Realizing there are only seconds left before his death, he kicks away the ladder and falls, ripping off his tongue just as the train slams into him, turning the detective into a bloody stain on the windshield. That's one down and five to go. Okay, this is super unfair. The man only had two minutes to escape this trap, and both of his choices guaranteed to end in death. This already makes it absolutely clear that whoever's doing this is only interested in vengeance, and that makes her chances of survival extremely slim. First of all, ripping out your own tongue is not a viable option, because the tongue is connected to the oral floor, which is a massive network of other connective tissues that are attached to each other in your mouth. If your tongue is ripped out, it's going to take the oral floor and most of your jaw along with it. Even if you manage to survive, you'd pass out from the physical shock and the train would run you down. So we need another way to escape this trap that won't get us killed. The best way to think of this is by prioritizing the threat. And right now, the most dangerous threat is the train because it's the only factor in this that has a ticking clock. Look at it this way. If we know that in less than two minutes, we're going to be killed by a train, then it's obviously the first thing we should be thinking about how to beat. And it makes it way more important than solving how to free your tongue from the vice. If you deal with this problem based on the biggest threat first, then it simplifies the trap for you so that you don't get overwhelmed and panic before figuring out what you should do to survive. The first thing to do is make sure we support ourselves from a stronger part of the body. So we should reach up and wrap these chains here around our arms as much as possible to protect our tongue. If we accidentally kick this chair down, then all of your body's weight is going to be on your tongue, and we can't let that happen, so we need more points of contact to hold ourselves up. This adds stronger support between you and the chain, and creates slack on the line so our tongue won't be at risk of being ripped out. Now, if we look up to the ceiling of the tunnel, there are pillars that create a gap between the train and the ceiling. If you look here, you can also see that there's several feet of space above the train, and if you manage to get up there, you just might be able to avoid getting hit. But this would be a losing strategy. The major problem with this solution is that this guy had to literally rip barbed wire through his wrists in order to free his hands, and that's going to seriously limit your ability to pull yourself all the way up this chain. I mean, look, John Constantine can't even light his own cigarette after sustaining life-threatening injuries to his wrists, so clutching these chains with your hands is pretty much out of the question. We're also suspended from the lowest point of the ceiling, so there would be no way to pull yourself up high enough to hide in the gap. This leaves you with only one possible solution to avoid the train. If it were me, I would wrap my arms around the chain and begin swinging. By pushing off of the walls on either side of the tunnel, we might be able to time it right and avoid a head-on collision. You'll still be hit by the side of the train cars, but you'll be rolling off of them instead. A subway train's average speed is about 17 miles per hour, so there's a much better chance of survival under these conditions than the alternative. 
There are also these poles here that you could easily grab with your feet, and the great thing is that the pillars here on the sides create much more of a gap between the train and the walls of the tunnel. This gives you more room to hide behind them and protect your body, and you can pull yourself to safety using your feet instead of your injured hands. If we can avoid death even for a few seconds, the train will hit the television in the middle of the tracks, and the conductor will be forced to stop the train immediately under their safety protocols. Once the train is stopped, we'll be able to make enough noise to call for help and be saved. It's a long shot, but it's literally the only strategy that has a chance, and I'll be damned if we don't try. Now, this is just the beginning, because there are four more death traps, and the last one will shock you, because it's one of the most unbeatable traps in the entire franchise, and I'm going to tell you exactly how to escape it. The next day, Detective Zeke and his brand new partner, Shenk, are called to investigate a death. Arriving at the subway, they find the dead body of the man who was run over by the train. His new partner thinks it's just a homeless guy who wanted to end it, but that's when Zeke here notices this corpse is wearing a smartwatch and a ring on his finger. So he couldn't have been just some random homeless person, and they both realize there's a lot more to this case than meets the eye. They return back to the precinct to make a report, but that's when the detective gets a strange package in the mail. Inside, he discovers a thumb drive and plugs it into his partner's computer to see what's on it. A video starts playing, showing the trademark symbol of the notorious Jigsaw, who died 15 years ago. The copycat killer promises that he's coming after every corrupt cop in their department, but Zeke here recognizes the building in the video. It's the courthouse, and he decides to check it out. Arriving at the scene, they find the red spiral painted on the wall and a package hidden on a windowsill. Retrieving the box, the cop opens it up carefully and is shocked to find a gift-wrapped tongue with a police badge inside, but he doesn't know who it belongs to. Whoever's doing this is a cop killer, and he's coming after every single one of them. Later at the precinct, the captain reveals that the body from the subway is Detective Boss, a member of their police department. Upset at losing a close friend, Zeker demands to be the leading investigator on the case, and the captain agrees. But soon he'll discover that this is just the beginning of a game Taylor made for him. Okay. These detectives should have taken the killer's threat much more seriously. In the video, the killer promised he was going to hunt down every dirty cop in their department, but if this police force had any brains, they'd realize that this one message has just handed all the information we need to crack this case. First of all, the package of the thumb drive was sent specifically to Zeke here, and the video was speaking directly to him as well. There would be no reason for the killer to single him out unless it was either a personal vendetta or that he already knew that Zeke was leading the investigation. This is important, because nobody outside of this room would know that Zeke is the leading detective on this case, and that narrows down the pool of potential suspects to the members of this police department. Now we can deduce that this Jigsaw copycat has eyes and ears within this precinct, and that tells us exactly how we need to handle the investigation from this point on. Once we realize this, the most important thing to do is control the information, because then we can use it to draw out the killer. The smartest thing to do is feed misinformation about the case to other cops that we have reason to suspect and see how they react. The biggest advantage here is that we already know that this killer wants to kill dirty cops, so we can catch him easily by using dirty cops as bait. If I suspected someone in the department of being connected to the Jigsaw Killer, I would send other dirty cops to investigate leads on the case, and if the guy we suspected started sneaking off to track them down, then it gives us a really good reason to think that he's working with the killer. There's no guarantee this will work, but it makes it much harder for the killer to hide if he wants to continue killing other cops without getting caught. That night, Detective Fitch and his partner find one of the cameras outside a pawn shop. Watching the tapes, they see the thief that the first victim was chasing last night, and the man recognizes him as a junkie he's arrested before. He tells his partner to report back to the precinct while he goes to an abandoned factory to look for their suspect. Later that night, the detective arrives at the factory and goes inside to search for the junkie when he spots someone lying on a mattress. He tells the man to get up, but there's no response. Removing the blanket, he is startled to find a pig mask hiding underneath it, and the detective recognizes it as a sign that the killer was here. He tries to call for backup, but never notices the hooded figure in the shadows. He's then grabbed from behind and becomes the next person to play Jigsaw's game. Waking up, the man finds himself with a metal trap over his head and his fingers stuck in fishnets attached to a massive gearbox. Panicking, he tries to break himself free, but has no way to escape and the fishnets attached to his fingers are too tight to remove. That's when this television set turns on and the killer tells him he wants to play a game. As a dirty cop, years ago he shot and killed an innocent man just because he felt insulted, and now he must pay for his crime. In 90 seconds, this metal container will be filled with water, and if it reaches these copper wires before he escapes, he'll be electrocuted. The only way to survive is to bite down on the device to start the motor and rip his trigger-happy fingers off. 
With the clock ticking, the man bites down on the bar and the gears start to turn as the machine pulls him forward. The fishing line leads his arms through a pipe railing and as the lines tighten, his fingers begin to slowly tear from his hands. It's absolutely horrifying and he manages to stay conscious but he's run out of time. The water reaches the copper wires and the detective is electrocuted to a crisp. That's two down and four to go. Okay. This might seem hopeless, but if you look closely enough, you'll realize this jigsaw copycat is getting lazy because there are several ways he could have hacked this death trap. Just like the first trap, the most important problem to solve is time because in 90 seconds, this pool is going to fill up and will be electrocuted. The smartest thing to do is to immediately run to the edge of the pool to create slack on the line because this buys us more space to move around and look for a way to escape. Now, if we prioritize the threats, the next thing we should go for are the copper wires here, because this is where the electricity will be coming from. If we run up and twist these wires off the poles and out of the water, then even if the pool overflows, we won't be electrocuted, and that's one less time constraint we will need to worry about. The last problem to solve is the finger trap, but if we act quickly, it's not as hard as it might seem. The only way to escape is by cutting through the nets on each finger, but luckily, the killer left us a very short material right here in the pool. I would break this light bulb here and use the sharps of the bulb to fray the nets and cut our fingers loose. This solution will give you more time to escape than any other option because if you have a shard of glass in your hand, you can still try to cut yourself free even after the gearbox pulls your hands through the pipe rail. This man wasted valuable time mindlessly fighting against the trap and didn't consider what options he had to work with until it was too late. The next day, Zekir gets another gift box from the killer and plugs the USB stick into his computer. This time, the video shows a pickup truck under a bridge and a little doll telling him that until he reveals his secret, more cops will die. The detectives arrive at the scene of the crime and slowly approach the truck. Zekir opens the door and suddenly a rotting pig corpse falls out, but inside is another gift wrap package from the killer. Opening the box, they're horrified to discover 10 ripped off fingers and the police badge of Detective Fitch, their fellow officer. That's when Zekir starts to recognize a pattern. He remembers years ago when he had requested for backup, and the very same detective didn't bother responding to the call. Zekir had to face an armed gunman alone and got shot in the process. Both cops who have gone missing from the department were dirty cops, and it must have been why they were chosen. Trying to put the pieces together, Zeke heads to the abandoned factory where they find the body of the second victim. He died in a brutal death trap, but there must have been another reason why he was targeted. Zeke asks the dead cop's partner why the man was snooping around this factory, and she tells him they were both investigating the security cameras in the area. They found a tape of the man who the first victim was chasing. It was a junkie that they arrested before, and knew he slept in this factory from time to time. Her partner investigated the place on his own without her, but she has no idea if he found the junkie or not. Without any leads, the cops try to figure out why the killer has chosen this police department and what his personal reason might be. The rookie then asks him if this killer could be someone who has a grudge against Zeke here, and that gives him an idea. They visit a church where an AA meeting is taking place, and the rookie finds out the group's leader was Zeke's former partner. We learn that years ago, this guy killed an innocent civilian, and it was all approved by Article 8, which gave cops free reign to crack down hard on crime by any means necessary. Zeke here testified against his partner and put him in jail, but everyone on the police force has hated him ever since. The detective asks the ex-cop where he was on July 4th, and the man tells him he was here at a meeting that night. Zeke knows something is off and can't figure out how all the pieces fit together, but by the time he realizes who's doing this, he'll have no choice but to join the killer to survive. Okay, this has gone far enough. In the video that the killer sent to them, he clearly stated that he was planning to hunt down members of this dirty police department, and now with two dead cops, that's enough to tell me that it's a bad f***ing idea to continue this investigation. As detectives, they're required to follow leads, but the killer is using their investigation to lure them into a controlled environment where he can make them his next victim. If it were me, I would strongly advocate to dump this investigation into the hands of the FBI, and they would have no choice but to take responsibility for the case. A potential mass murder of police officers is already going to draw attention of federal law enforcement, and since the jigsaw killer has committed crimes across state lines, it automatically becomes FBI jurisdiction. This means the corrupt police force won't have to get involved on any level, and if they aren't investigating the case, then they are much less likely to be lured out by the killer and captured. It's not a foolproof tactic, but it makes it much harder for the killer to target them because he won't be able to predict their movements. The obvious solution is restricting the killer's actions in any way you can, because he'll be pushed further out into the open to get what he wants, and as soon as he makes a mistake, he'll be much easier to capture. The next morning, another green package arrives from the killer, and this time, it's much bigger. 
Looking inside, he finds a doll wearing a pig mask, but they're horrified when they discover that it's wrapped in human skin. He takes a letter out of the box, reading a warning from the killer that he should be careful while he searches for more victims because he's going to take his head. The detective flips the doll around and discovers a piece of flesh with the name Charlie tattooed on it. He realizes the skin was taken from his partner's arm. They're horrified, but this detective notices that there's something else inside. Lifting the layer of human flesh, he removes a bottle of Constantine branded paint, and Zeke knows exactly what that is. His father used to take him to the same place when it used to be a hobby shop during his childhood. He leaves the police station and heads to Constantine, which is now a butcher shop. They walk into the back room, horrified to find the corpse of his new partner hanging from a meat hook, and all of his skin has been removed. That's three down, and three more to go. Zeke is torn that his own partner has been killed and can do nothing about it. Every new death is getting more personal than the last, and Zeke here will stop at nothing to get revenge. Leaving the crime scene, Zeke is headed back to the police station when a dispatcher calls in. Another officer has been attacked nearby, and realizing it fits the killer's pattern, he responds to the call. Arriving at the scene, he parks his car and walks through the crowded streets to look for the injured cop. When he finds him, the man reveals he was attacked by someone wearing a pig mask. Suddenly, he remembers the message that the killer sent to him in the box, threatening to take his head, and he realizes that Angie, the head of the police department, is in danger. He immediately tries to call her, but she's down in the precinct basement and can't get a signal. She's next to die, and this jigsaw copycat has already set up the most unfair death trap we've ever seen. The police captain walks into the cold case room, and that's when she sees the masked killer standing inside. The door behind her suddenly closes itself shut, and she tries to call for help, but that's when smoke bombs fill the room with a toxic gas. The woman collapses to the floor unconscious, with no one around to save her. The captain wakes up restrained to a metal slab with a faucet looming over her face. Finding a tape recorder beside her, she plays a recording and the killer tells her she's about to be punished for her crimes. For years, she helped cover up corruption in her department, and now she's going to be covered in burning hot wax until she suffocates. Her only way to escape is to sever her spinal cord using this blade under her neck. As soon as the tape stops, the hot wax begins to drip onto her face, and she starts screaming in agony. Okay. This is really unfair. The killer gave her a choice to either suffocate from burning wax or to sever her spinal cord. This is a death sentence, and once again, time is not on her side. But that doesn't mean this isn't unbeatable. The first problem to deal with is this cloth. The only reason it's on her head is to make sure the wax covers her face enough to suffocate her. The cloth is added to the death trap for a very specific reason, and it's the same reason it's used in waterboarding. If you have a cloth over your face like this, it allows water to enter your nose and mouth, but you can't spit the water back out because it's being blocked by the cloth. So I first will be doing everything I can to remove the cloth before the wax hardens over my airways and I suffocate to death. Now, the second thing to consider is that this wax is currently in liquid form, and just like any liquid, it wants to flow towards the path of least resistance. It might sound obvious, but this is a really big deal, because it means you might actually have some control over this thing. Let's face it, this woman is completely tied down, and nobody can hear her scream. This is nearly impossible to escape, but even though things look hopeless here, the one and only thing that we can control is where the liquid flows. This is a natural law of physics, and it means surviving becomes simply about directing the flow of the liquid away from your airways to ensure that you don't suffocate. The best and only way to do this is to turn your head sideways and tilt it at a sloping angle to direct the flow of the wax away from your nose and mouth. It's really important to remember that we don't actually need to escape this trap at all, because this woman is already inside of the police station. Eventually, someone will find her, and that's a huge advantage that the two other victims didn't have. All we need to do is beat the time constraint and survive long enough to be rescued by someone else in the building. Zeke finally arrives at the police station and walks through the offices searching for the captain, but Detective O'Brien here tells him she's in the basement looking into a cold case. He runs down the stairs into the lower levels, and they race to unlock the door. But when they make it inside, they find the woman laying still on the slab. Her entire head is encased in hardened black wax, and when the man peels away the layers, he realizes they're too late. She was already dead before he got here. That's four down, and it'll be two to go. Furious, he looks over the surveillance footage of the room and discovers that 13 minutes of video is missing from the tapes. The killer must have hacked the system and deleted the records. Zeke finds a list of people who logged into the police server in the last few hours and recognizes the badge number of his older partner, who's no longer a cop. Deciding to bring him in for questioning, he heads out the door, but the other detective points out that his father is also a suspect. 
As the former police captain, the man had access to the surveillance system, and the place where the rookie's body was found was somewhere he took Zeke as a kid. The detective flips out on him for the accusation, and they get into a fight. But the man can't argue with the truth. His father might be a suspect, but he has no idea where he is. He arrives at the church where his old partner lives and storms into the building screaming his name, but nobody is inside. With no clues, the detective begins to walk out and call his dad to leave a voice message, but as soon as he steps out of the church, he is grabbed by a figure in a pig mask and knocked out cold. When he wakes up, he finds himself handcuffed to a pipe in an abandoned factory and sees another man tied to the ceiling. That's when he notices a bobby pin on the floor and uses it to pick the lock in his handcuffs. Getting up, he walks over to the man and takes the bag off of his head to discover that it's his old partner. Zeke here still thinks he's the killer and takes a recorder from the man's neck to play the tape. The copycat Jigsaw challenges him to a game, giving him the choice of rescuing his old partner or letting him die and throwing away the key. That's when a buzzer goes off and activates this massive glass grinder. The detective realizes what's going to happen and tries to pick the locks, but it's no use. The first bottles fall into the grinder and the glass begins to shoot out. Zeke runs out of the way and hides as the man gets shredded by the glass until the machine finally powers down. Okay, this could have been easily avoided, but this is the one trap so far where the time limit is actually a blessing in disguise. This machine powers itself back down after 17 seconds, and that gives us a window to intervene without getting ourselves killed in the process. Obviously, the easier thing to do would be to let him die, but it's not the smartest decision. This is no longer about escaping, it's about whether we decide to save him or not. Now, for all we know, the real trap could be to frame us as the Jigsaw copycat, and if this room were rigged with cameras and were watching us as we decide to sit back and let this man die, that wouldn't exactly help our case. So the best decision here is to save him. The good news is, it's a very beatable trap with some help. There's a lot of stuff in this room that you could use to try and help this man out without getting yourself hurt in the process. If you look here, these are huge crates of recycled glass bottles, and the shelf here is not fixed to the ground. I would move the shelving unit in front of the holes here so that when the glass starts shooting out, it's going to be hitting the shelf and the boxes on it, and that's going to prevent this guy from getting sliced to death from the flying glass. Since the holes here are at about head height, if Zeke was close enough to the machine, he could easily go underneath and pull the shelf into place without getting hurt at all. Once there's something blocking most of the glass from hitting anyone, the next thing we should do is simply knock down as many bottles off of the conveyor belt as possible, because if no bottles are going into the machine, then no glass is going to come flying out of it. Now it's also extremely likely that this machine has an emergency shutoff switch somewhere in the room, and if no glass is shooting out, then we could use the rest of our time looking for how to turn the machine off. Zeke runs back to help the man out of his chains, but the device powers back up and starts shooting glass through the air. Zeke runs back into hiding as the glass shards blow even faster than before and they tear this man's back into pieces. It's absolutely brutal, but that's when Zeke here remembers what the serial killer's tape said about throwing away the key and sees a trash can in a corner of the room. Flipping it over, a key to the padlock drops out onto the floor. Running through the flying glass with only a trash can to protect himself, the detective unlocks his ex-partner's chains and the death trap shuts off, but the man has already died from his wounds. That's five down and only one to go. A door suddenly opens and the detective goes through to confront the Jigsaw copycat. As he enters the next room, he's surprised to discover his rookie partner is waiting for him. This rookie faked his own death and reveals that his own father was shot 15 years ago by none other than Zeke's former partner. As a child, he saw the whole thing with his own eyes and remembered that Zeke was the only one who stood up for justice because he ratted his partner out and put him behind bars. Now, the killer wants to make a deal and asks Zeke here to help him kill all the dirty cops in the department. But that's when the rookie here tells him something completely unexpected. He's been keeping Zeke's father hostage for days without anyone knowing and the only way he can save him is to accept his offer. With no choice, the detective agrees to help the killer, but only if he promises to set his dad free first. The rookie isn't sure if he can trust him, and decides to make a call to the police, reporting that there's a crazed gunman at this abandoned factory. That's when the killer gives him the gun to put him through one final test. Entering another room, he sees his father suspended in a death machine with tubes draining his blood into jars on the ground. Horrified to see his dad in a death trap, he demands that the killer set his father free, but the rookie reveals he's only got one bullet left in the chamber and he'll need to use it to save his father. Looking out the window, the killer sees the cops have arrived and tells Zeke that he has three minutes to save his dad before his body is fully drained of blood, but the only way to set him free is to shoot a bullet at this target. Okay, this is one of the stupidest things I've ever seen. 
This is like a carnival game for the criminally insane, and if you hit the target, you get a prize that nobody wants. The first thing we need to point out is that this is way too much blood. The human body has about 1.5 gallons, and from what I can see here, he's already drained more than that. Each of these 8 bottles around him definitely look like they could be 2 liters in size. So if they're all filled halfway up, then he would have drained more blood than his body even had to begin with, and he should be dead. Now, if we put this problem aside for the moment, there's actually a perfectly logical way to solve this death trap in less than 3 minutes. First, we should take out the threat, so I would shoot the rookie in the leg. We need him alive so that he can be interrogated, and if the SWAT team arrives to find a dead cop, they'll get the wrong idea about the situation. We also need to remember that time is our enemy, so the next thing to do is gather all the tubes that are draining the father's blood and tie knots into them. This will take less than one minute to accomplish, and once the tubes are tied, the blood will have nowhere to flow, so the father will be safe. The last thing I would do is throw the empty gun at the target to help the father down. It's low enough to be within throwing distance, and since his blood isn't flowing out anymore, it doesn't matter if you miss the target and need to try a couple of times to hit it. Once the father is lowered down, then we can start to take the needles out of his arms and try to help him out of the trap. As Zekir tries to decide what to do, the killer reveals that his father is hiding a dark secret and forces him to tell his son the truth. That's when the father confesses that when he was chief of police, he was the one who ordered the whole department to cut the crime rate by any means necessary, and that included shooting innocent people like the rookie's father. Zeke can't believe what he's hearing, but with no choice, he shoots the target and sets his father free. He runs up to check on his dad, but the killer is getting away. Leaving him behind, the detective chases after the jigsaw copycat, trying to stop him, but he's just made his biggest mistake yet. The SWAT team has arrived and starts to saw the door open, but they cut right through a tripwire that activates a motorized winch. The father is suddenly pulled back into the air by the strings attached to his body, and as the SWAT team bursts into the room, everything goes horribly wrong. They point their guns at the man, and Zeke comes running out trying to explain, but suddenly, a gun slides down out of the trap and into the father's hands. His arm is lifted up at the strings, pointing it straight at the SWAT team, and they brutally gun the man down. That's now 5 dead, and Zeke realizes he's failed to save every single victim from their death trap. There's nothing he can do, and the new Jigsaw Killer escapes before anyone can stop Chris Rock from pitching a sequel. But what do you think? How would you beat Spiral? Let me know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How to Beat playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.